Joining me on the phone to discuss some of the big foodborne outbreaks of 2013 and to shed some light on food safety law is attorney William Marler. Bill is the managing partner with the food safety law firm Marler Clark. Hello, Bill, and thanks for talking to me today. Yeah, good morning. Thanks. Um, in addition to being a lawyer, uh, you are also the publisher of the website Food Safety News, a very good website. I encourage my uh, listeners to check it out, foodsafetynews.com. Uh, let's start out our discussion with the end of your article published uh, late last week, the 10 biggest foodborne illness outbreaks of 2013. Um, how was this list compiled? Was it strictly by the number of cases, or were there other factors used to rank 1 through 10? Well, the reporters, the four reporters for uh, Food Safety News, you know, obviously are covering these things, you know, in real time over the course of the year. Um, right. They they primarily were looking at uh, ones that had the highest numbers, um, but also sort of had, you know, I think, you know, some public interest by, you know, the type of the food product or sort of some, some level of interest. So, um, you know, I think there were a lot of factors that went into it, and it's kind of an interesting – it is an interesting list. Um, you know, um, having cyclospora in it is – you know, that's something that, you know, we haven't seen for a decade. Um, right. Lots of salmonella outbreaks, and then, you know, a handful of E. coli outbreaks. Um, uh, I think one was interesting having a O21, uh, E. coli O21 outbreak. Um, so there were some pretty interesting outbreaks. Yeah, and um – not only are you an attorney, but you're also very knowledgeable on these actual organisms. So I'm going to try to get your thoughts on a, a couple of these outbreaks. Sure. Um, number four was the hepatitis A from Townsend Farms frozen organic berries. Right. And of course, right. it was eventually linked to the pomegranate seeds from Turkey, which were in the berry mix. In your professional opinion, because I, when I look at it, I, I don't know. Um, was this one preventable? And if so, what could have been, what could have been done? Well, you know, hepatitis A um, is a, uh, you know, a fecal virus. Um, right. It's, uh, you know, transmitted from, you know, human feces. It's a human virus transmitted from human feces you know, into the mouths of other people. Um, and really what it, it, it in, you know, any time you have a hepatitis A outbreak linked to, you know, either an ill worker who passes it on to, you know, ill customers or, you know, when there's been, um, you know, fruit or vegetable uh, outbreaks linked to hepatitis A like this one, um, you know, usually there's a contaminated water source. Um, and to, you know, contaminate this much berries that, you know, get transmitted, you know, all over the world, um, it's, you know, it, there's there's clearly some negligence, you know, in the production uh, line at some point. Um you know, I do agree with you that it's, you know, that it has been linked um, fairly definitively to uh, Turkish pomegranates. The particular strain of hepatitis is not one that's normally seen uh, in the U.S. or even in the Western Hemisphere. So it's it's pretty clear where, where it came from. Yeah. And um, number two, um, and this, this outbreak just continues to linger. This is the salmonella from Foster Farms chicken. Right, right, and, right. And, and one yeah, point I want to make about it is, is, yeah, it says at least 162 people have been hospitalized like, uh, after likely undercooking the contaminated raw chicken or handling it in a way that led to accidental cross-contamination. So my question is, I've talked to other food safety people. Some place the blame on the consumer, raw chicken, mm -hmm. et cetera, and others blame the company. Where do you stand? Well, it's interesting. Um, uh, the um, the the verbiage that is used by both Foster Farms and FSIS uh, regarding this particular outbreak um, it reminds me remarkably uh, of the language that was used uh, in 1993 and 1994 when talking about E. coli 0157H7. Um, it's the press releases and the, and the comments are almost identical that, you know, if only people handled it properly, if only people cooked it properly. Um, you know, this is a fairly significant problem at Foster Farms. Um, and this is, you know, the, the, the reality is, is that, you know, there have been over 550 people sickened in uh, 2013 that are confirmed 
Um, and as you know, um, you know, for each one person that is actually counted a stool culture positive person, uh, the CDC estimates that there's another 38 or 39 times that number that actually were sickened. So this is a significant outbreak with a lot of significantly sick people, um, some who get counted and some don't. Uh, you know, to answer your question, you know, directly about, you know, is it the consumer's fault? I mean, the, the chain of distribution and, you know, the, the whole farm-to-fork a cliche, you know, we all bear responsibility for doing what we can to protect ourselves uh, and our consumers from illness. Um, but but this is becoming, I think, a, you know, a larger problem, especially with the number of people who were hospitalized, uh, the antibiotic-resistant nature of uh, some of these pathogens. Um, I think it's past time uh, for the meat industry, whether it be chicken, turkey, or beef, to really sort of come to grips with uh, antibiotic-resistant salmonella, frankly, similar to the way they did successfully with E. coli 0157H7. Okay. And um, your number one story, of course, was cyclospora. I did a top 10 infectious disease um, list for 2013, and this was my highest-ranking foodborne illness mm -hmm. also. Um, well, and this is where I like to transition. Our, uh, I'm sorry? I said great minds think alike. So. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> this is where I'd like to transition our discussion into food safety law. And I don't know if you can answer this question or not, but did you represent anybody in this outbreak? I, I do not. Okay. But I'm very well, familiar with the outbreak and obviously very familiar sure. with the All right. So I guess for a lay person like me and a mm -hmm. lot of our a lot of my listeners, um, when you get a situation like this legally, what is the chain of events? You know, how do you decide – who to sue, the restaurant, the producer. Um, right. I guess part of the reason I'm asking is I know there, there's you're not the only food safety attorney out there. And some the of them... Good, the only good one. So There you go. <laughs> but some of them, <laughs> some start advertising before they even know where the cyclospora came from, what the food source was, what restaurants were involved. Um, so I'm trying to figure out what is the chain of events for... A food safety law case. Is that sure? Clear? Well, let's let me. That's I think that's a it's a really great question. And and uh, and and let me maybe I could just sort of tell you how sort of we do things here at Marla Clark and how we've been doing it, you know, for 20 sure. years. I have I have an on staff epidemiologist, and so our office runs pretty much like you would expect a uh, health department runs. Um, we we get lots of phone calls. Probably, uh, you know, nine out of ten calls or emails that we get from potential victims, we you know uh, vet and turn down um, and for lots of reasons. One, you, you know, uh, you can't prove causation, which I'll talk a little bit more about. But a lot of times there are cases that you know that people you know they, they found something in their jello or they found something in there whatever and and it's not really a, a claim that we would bring forward but, but primarily what we focus on is what caused the person's illness and if you can prove more likely than not that that this particular product was contaminated with a particular pathogen that made the person sick uh, you know then it's clear that the product was adulterated and um, and that the manufacturer has a legal problem. Um, and so we look a lot very hard at uh, does a person have a stool culture positive for a particular pathogen? You know, did the product test positive? Um, or is the outbreak large enough and crossing state lines enough uh, that you can triangulate back onto a particular product or a particular restaurant or a particular manufacturer. So it's a, you know, our whole focus is on the science of it. Uh, the law part of it is pretty straightforward if you're able to prove more likely than not that this product caused that illness. Does that make some sense? Yeah, it, it definitely clear things up quite a bit. Okay. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. As a matter of fact, I mean, there's actually so many questions I have, but my show is only 30 minutes. Um, <laughs> well, so we can do it again. Let me go ahead and, um, and I hope I can have you on again. 
by the way. Um, let me close with a post that you wrote on Marler Blog about a week or two ago, and it was your ode to the beef industry. Um, for listeners who are not familiar with Bill Marler, uh, he gained a lot of national notoriety in the 1993 Jack in the Box E. coli outbreak. Am I correct about that? Yep. Yeah, I was much younger then, <laughs> and my hair was dark. So, but then that's it. it has nothing to do with meat. It has to do with three teenage daughters. That's there you go. <laughs> okay, and that, and that was two decades ago. Um, yeah, but I, I found that post very uh, interesting. Can you go ahead and talk about that for a second? Well. Um, Sort sort to give a historical perspective, um, you know, sure. E. coli 0157H7, which is a, a well now a well known pathogen, uh, you know, sickened several hundred people, uh, killed four uh, in an outbreak linked ultimately linked to Jack in the Box restaurants in 1993 and late 1992. At that time, E. coli 0157 was not considered to be an adulterant. Similar to the way antibiotic-resistant salmonella today is not considered to be an adulterant on meat. In 1994-93, E. coli was not considered to be an adulterant as well. And what the import of that was is that um, if a producer found E. coli 0157 in meat, it was completely legal for them to ship it into the marketplace. Just like today, if Foster Farms finds antibiotic-resistant salmonella on their chicken, it's completely legal for them to ship it into the marketplace, and even when it sickens people, not do a recall. So that was sort of the way things were for E. coli in 1994. Mike Taylor, who at the time was an interim uh, head of FSIS, Food Safety Inspection Services, made a remarkable uh, speech uh, in 1994 where he, in front of the American Meat Institute, said, from now, from here on out, E. coli 0157 in hamburger is an adulterant, per se. It's it, You can't have it in E. coli, and if you find it there, you can't ship it. If you find it, it has to be recalled. Um, that was an enormous shock to the beef industry. They immediately sued FSIS to stop that. They lost, um, and over time, that process of that being an adulterant uh, was implemented with lots of kicking and screaming, lots of angst, um, and but the the functional reality is it didn't happen overnight, and it took some years. But um, in from 1993 to the uh, Conagra E. coli outbreak in, 19, in 2002, but 95% of the revenue in my firm was E. coli cases linked to hamburger. You know, as I'm standing in my office today, that's nearly zero. And the reason is, uh, and why you know I have to uh, uh, give credit where credit is due, is is the beef industry, although you know certainly with kicking and screaming, um, stepped up. And um, and so the number of E. coli cases linked to hamburger has you know just absolutely dropped like a stone. Took some time, uh, it took some effort, took money, took commitment, but you know they rose to the challenge, and you know uh, our food is safer because of that. And I think that's a lesson that can be learned across all you know sectors of the food industry. Okay, great. Since you brought up E. coli, something just crossed my mind. Do you have time for one more question? Sure, sure, sure. Go ahead. Sure. It's actually a hypothetical, but I know a couple of weeks ago I interviewed uh, Dr. Abby Cannon. She's with the EIS, with the CDC, mm -hmm. uh, concerning the outbreak in Wisconsin last holiday season where uh, people were uh, knowingly eating cannibal sandwiches. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, so this is a hypothetical, I imagine, but if you're knowingly eating raw ground beef, is there liability to that? Uh, the short answer is yes. I mean, um, uh, the uh, if, uh, the way to think about that question is there's, in a courtroom, uh, when the, a defendant and a plaintiff, so when a victim and a producer walk into that courtroom, there's 100% liability in that courtroom. And how it gets apportioned between the plaintiff and the defendant is up to the jury. 
And uh, if, if, for example, if you and I went out and ate tiger, sand- tiger meat sandwiches, uh, the jury probably wouldn't be very sympathetic to us because we should know better. Um, what if the, the fact is it's a 16-year-old boy who didn't know anything about E. coli and um, or, you know, or he was at a party and it was, you know, out there as a, as a uh, hors d'oeuvre and just simply ate it because he didn't, you know, frankly know what it was. I mean, so the facts always are, you know, it's not just like black and white. It depends upon who the victim is. It depends upon who the manufacturer is. Does that make some sense? Yeah. yeah. Oh, perfect. Yeah. I mean, I, I've learned so much, I have to tell you. Um, yeah, that's the great thing. And, you know, the one thing, the great thing, I, and that's why I like being a lawyer, there's, things aren't quite so black and white in the law, and, and they take into account, you know, different people in different, you know, situations. And, um, you know, and as it relates to a manufacturer who um, is producing a product that they know is going to be served raw, to my view, they have either a higher burden to make sure that that product is absolutely pristine or they have a burden to really think twice about whether or not you know, serving that product or manufacturing that product is even something that should, they should be doing. Fantastic. Okay, I'm out of time now. Um, okay. I've been talking to Bill Marler. He's the uh, managing partner and attorney with Marler Clark, the food safety law firm. Uh, thanks, Bill, for your expertise and perspective. Hey, no problem, and have a, a great new year. All right, you too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.